Cops and prosecutors and epidemiologists, public health nurses, county coroners, all of this is being fought by really anonymous folks all across the country because this epidemic is also uh, the quietest epidemic. It's filled with shame. Obvious overdose, known history of heroin use, uh, admitted to using heroin today. He was found unconscious. They kind of roused him. They're going to start an IV on him. You don't have a lot of violence. People die alone in a McDonald's bathroom toilet. And then when the people die, when the kids die, the parents are so mortified, so ashamed that they keep quiet too. And the thing is left to perpetrate and spread. This wave is hitting every community across King County, sparing no race, no age, no gender, no neighborhood, no income level. Just in the past six months, I've had to put five officers' kids into treatment for heroin. I had never seen that before. I couldn't imagine. I could not imagine I had a daughter that was using heroin. How much do you use a day? Like five dollars. Okay, and how long have you been using? We need a variety of treatment options available on demand. One size does not fit all, and we need to have help available when people reach out for it. I think our family story and the loss of Mara is great proof that this can happen to anyone. Hello, I'm Enrique Cerna of KCTS 9, and welcome to MOHAI, the Museum of History and Industry here on Seattle's South Lake Union. We are here to talk about a public health crisis. It's the growing epidemic of opiates and heroin, taking lives and tearing apart families. Here in King County, more people enter detox for heroin than enter treatment for alcohol. Unfortunately, this is not a new challenge. History tells us we've been here before. Let me turn now to Mohai Executive Director Leonard Garfield to give us some perspective. If you could stand up there, Leonard, for me. Uh, share for me a bit of the history of opiates and heroin addiction here in Seattle and King County. You know, Enrique, it goes all the way back to the late 19th century. Not long after the American community here really got settled, opiates and, and drugs like heroin came into the community. We were a wide open port city connected to the rest of the world, really, and that kind of trade was part of being a maritime community. By the early 20th century, we actually had opiate addiction, pretty serious problem, in neighborhoods like Pioneer Square. And social workers would go down in the early 20th century to Pioneer Square at night. They'd try to rescue uh, opium a addicts, uh, oftentimes women, sometimes women involved in the sex trade. And they'd take them back to more respectable homes where behind closed doors you could often hear the anguish cries as they were going through forced withdrawal. And it was a problem that just escalated. During World War II, for example, as thousands of people came to join the workforce, to live here, fairly transient uh, drug issues and addictions with opioids came with them and all the way up into more recent years um, in terms of challenges of usage, challenges of treatment, um, needle exchange programs pioneered here in, in Seattle, and then the challenge of homeless young people on Seattle streets in the 1970s and 80s where drug addiction uh, and the sex trade often were linked, and those were challenges. So things have changed over time. The geography is a bit different, the complexion a bit different, but there's a long, continuous history there that I think helps illuminate some of our discussions today. You know, uh, people have asked me, why are you doing this in Mohai? Because Mohai really focuses on, uh, as a museum in, in history. Um, why is this important? Well, you know, history is a tool. It's not just memories or nostalgia. It's a tool for learning about what we've done right, what we've done wrong, and how we can apply that to tackling the challenges of the future. Mohai really wants to be a catalyst for engaging community conversation about issues like tonight's conversation, but bringing some of the lens of history to help inform that discussion as well. So thank you for being a convener. Appreciate it very much. All right. Well, let me now intro, uh, introduce the people that are with us. Uh, I also want to note here that earlier this year, the PBS uh, documentary series Frontline aired a gripping two-hour report titled Chasing Heroin that examined America's 
heroin epidemic, Seattle and King County were prominently featured in the program, along with some of the members of our panel that are involved in addressing this issue in this epidemic. Joining us right now are Dan Satterberg, King County Prosecutor, Molly Carney, who's Executive Director of Evergreen Treatment Services, Caleb Bantagreen, Senior Research Scientist with the University of Washington's Alcohol Drug Abuse Institute, and Penny Legate, the founder of the Mara Project, named in honor of her daughter, who died of a heroin overdose at the age of 19. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it very much. Well, Penny, I want to start with you. Um, you know, in the opening, that gripping soundbite from you, where you say that your daughter and the loss of her, uh, who would have ever thought? Hmm. And yet, this is happening across America today. Right. I think what people need to understand is this, as we saw in the, in the open of this program, that this does not discriminate. It does, it, you know, recognizes no age, um, socioeconomic strata, race, ethnicity, uh, rural, urban, rural areas. And um, for me, I grew up in Nebraska. I was not exposed to hardcore drugs at all. So to think that one day I would grow it up, grow up and have a child, a child that would be lost to heroin what was unthinkable, especially in a family that was very close, that uh, watched everything she did. Uh, she was a, you know, incredibly beautiful, intelligent, um, effervescent, popular girl. And um, to think that she would die of a heroin overdose was just really never something, it was unthinkable. This has changed your life dramatically. Not only you lose a child, but um, I know that one of the things that has motivated you now is to try to inform the public mm -hmm. that this can happen to right. anyone. Well, what I found is after Mara's death that uh, the secret society that's out there in uh, behind gated communities and in the streets and wherever have come forward and said we're misunderstood. Uh, what do I do if my child has an addiction? She, you know, he or she does. And um, it became clear to me years ago that this was a rampant problem. And so one of the main things I'm trying to do as a parent who's lost a child is to reach out to other parents and other groups of uh, young parents who say it'll never happen to me and for those it does happen to, to tell them there is no shame, there is no stigma, and the way that people die is by hiding in the shadows and not talking about it. Caleb Bantagreen, uh, this problem, I guess what, what might be different in the history of looking at this, particularly in America right now, is that it has become so widespread and that it touches every community and major cities, small towns, uh, that you know, it is kind of sweeping the country in a way. Right, I mean, I, the issue is, is that um, people are wired to like opiates. And as uh, opiates began getting prescribed in much greater numbers about 20 years ago, many people who would never have had them otherwise were exposed to them and found out they liked them. Um, and so that's a happenstance of people's genetics, but also family history, trauma, social context, but we just had an explosion in opiate prescribing. And what we know now um, is that a majority of people who are using heroin say they were hooked on prescription opiates first. So if there ever was a gateway drug theory that it was appropriate, it actually is that pharmaceuticals can lead to heroin for people who are abusing them. So we have a dramatic increase in those opiates, and that's why it's hitting all aspects of society, including rural areas. It isn't that rural areas are catching it from urban areas, it's that rural areas also get prescribed opiates, they also have pain, and they also can be diverted and stolen and misused. Um, and what happened is, is that as those opiates became harder to get, uh, heroin just came in and, and filled that need for folks. One of the things that the Frontline documentary um, taught us, uh, informed us, is that um, the pharmaceutical business really kind of helped kick this off. And, but yet that the, prescri the prescribing of, of opiates today still continues. Mm -hmm. uh, I had sinus surgery a few years ago, and I was given quite a bit of Oxycontin afterwards. And I have to admit, I still have it. I, I haven't gotten rid of it. 
and I would dare say that there are a lot of people like me that have had these similar surgeries or whatever, and they still have the medication. Well, right, so we're always gonna have pain, and opiates will always be a good pain medicine, but it's trying to make sure that they're the right medicine for the condition the person has. And 20 years ago, historically, we were under-prescribing pain, and state medical boards said we're under-prescribing pain and we need to use opiates. Well, we did that, and about five years ago, that actually started to level off, and we've seen opiate prescribing coming down, still at higher levels, but opiate prescribing has come down. We'll always have opiate prescribing. We'll always have pain. So what we need to figure out is when is the appropriate time to use opiates, as well as other medications. There's a lot of other things that people use for physical and emotional stress, like alcohol and other drugs and other medications and heroin. They're all part and parcel of the same issue, which is that how do we medicate uh, discomfort, and should we be medicating discomfort all the time? Should we? Uh, no. <laughs> so the, the, it's really important. But it's so like the American way. Right. Well, and I think that's part pill. of the point is that, you know, if you go to the doctor's office and you have pain, you need to leave with something. And that, that something uh, isn't a, a balloon or a sticker. Uh, it's opiates. People want to leave with something just like with antibiotics. And just like we've been shifting the conversation that antibiotics aren't always the right medication, they can do more harm than good at the individual level and the population level. So, too, do we need to make that shift really early on. Um, so we need to t be targeting really young uh, children and their parents to understand, are medications the right answer? And if they are part of the reaction to a health condition, what else should they be doing? Because it is the rare medical condition that is fixed by a medication. Many other things need to happen, particularly when we're talking about emotional and physical pain. Uh, and that takes some more work. It takes active uh, effort. And we have been sort of sold that things should be passive and easy, and, and addressing stress is not a necessarily passive or easy thing to do, but it's something we all have to be able to do every day to function. Oh, I can, though, if I can jump in. Yeah, please do. Enrique is that we are still seeing, at least I have personally, when I've had a couple of, um, I had a broken bone and some other issues around pain, people just wrote a prescription for me for 30 Oxycontin without even asking, how's your pain level? And so here I have, you know, two prescriptions of 30 Oxys in my closet. And I was shocked by that because I thought that we were doing better in that regard. This is within the last year. So clearly the message hasn't gotten out to prescribers. And what, do they look at me and say, you're not a person that looks like someone who's going to abuse heroin? I don't know. Um, I just don't think the message is still to doctors and prescribers that this is a dangerous medication and we don't need it for abscessed teeth or, you know, uh, people go in, I hear of kids going in to have the wisdom teeth taken out and they're getting opiates for it. And so I'm, I'm still really alarmed that I do think that opioids are still being prescribed at high levels out there. That's been my personal experience. Ali Carney, I'm sure this is what you hear as someone who heads up treatment services for Evergreen. Yes, um, absolutely. So we run a medication-assisted treatment program for adults with opioid use disorders. And you both said something very important that needs to be followed up is what do you do with those opioids that are in your medicine cabinet? Because that's one of the uh, pieces of information that have not been shared appropriately yet with the, the public. And there are ways to properly dispose of them. First, they should be locked. I always say, I don't care who you live with, you should keep this locked in your cabinet because you never know who may be rifling through your medicine cabinet. And then when you're ready to, di to dispose of them, they should be uh, crushed up in cat litter or coffee grounds with liquid added to them and then thrown them in your trash. Don't flush them down the toilet. So that's a very important piece. In terms of the prescribing practices, opioids can be very useful. It's a question of the quantity in which they get prescribed. Mm -hmm. So uh, removal of wisdom teeth might be uh, a situation where opioids could be very useful, but I always, again, I say, have a conversation with your pharmacist. Don't take 30 Vicodin home, take two. You know, so there's, there's an issue around helping the public understand that these are dangerous medications that can lead to problematic behaviors, and that you all as consumers have a way of interacting with these dangerous medications to keep your, yourself and your loved ones safe. But what about physicians? Where is their responsibility in this? Well, I mean, just to be really clear, so right now about one in five adults is prescribed in opiate medicine every year and about one in 10 adolescents, so they are widely prescribed. And so physicians do have a responsibility and other prescribers as well to make sure that opiates are being prescribed when necessary. But what I what I'm also want to make clear is that that's the supply side, but there also is a demand side um, that is sort of generally in society that we like to get stuff 
and that patients show up and they also think that that's the right answer to their medical problem. And so absolutely, and there's a lot of education going on with physicians. There are a lot of efforts to try to rein in opiate prescribing, get it under control, make sure it's being prescribed at the appropriate times. But also I think it's just as important that as consumers, which we all are, and as patients, which many of us are too often, um, that we also know what the expectations should be you know, if you're going into a doctor and you have a, a medical problem that has pain that you're saying is at an eight out of 10, you should understand that opiates, a successful re regimen of opiates might get you down to a six, not a zero. Zero is not good, zero is dead, okay? So you wanna really have a reasonable expectation of what opiates can and cannot do. They might be able to help some with pain, but that's, that's a two-way conversation. That's a conversation that the physician should be trying to initiate and the patient should want to engage in. What we're hearing over and over again is um, people are sort of shocked and amazed that they don't realize that you can overdose and die on opiate pain medicines. Even that little bottle of 30 Vicodin can kill you. People don't understand that. And if you use it on a regular basis, you will physically become dependent. So there are things that happen that we know happen with opiates that if you have opiates in your household, you have to know. You need to know those basic, uh, basic pieces of education. Dan Satterberg, uh, this issue uh, has really required some change in the criminal justice system uh, because it is a public health issue. But for most people that work in the criminal justice area, it's usually get the bad guys or somebody's breaking a law, you put them in jail. But as the documentary showed us, uh, the Frontline documentary showed us, that Seattle is, has a, a lead program, a law enforcement, a, a assisted diversion effort going on. We'll talk more about this with others. But it, it's really having to change the way you and others in criminal justice work. Well, it's good to be here at the Museum of History and Industry, and, and it is history, it's recent history, 30 years ago, we were also hit with what we called an epidemic, and the issue then was crack cocaine. All of a sudden, cocaine could be available in a $20 hit. Anybody could get marketed widely in the urban core of every major American city, and it, it freaked people out. And our response back then, in this state and every other state, was let's get tough. Let's triple the sentences. Let's send people to prison. And the criminal justice system was given primary responsibility to deal with that issue, which was also a public health issue. So I hope that we've learned something in the 30 years I and mean, we're not rushing in to repeat those mistakes. Now there's a role for the criminal justice system, don't get me wrong, I mean, if we find people who are selling heroin for profit, we have no problem prosecuting them, but those aren't the cases that we see very often. Most of what we see is one addicted person selling a tiny amount of heroin to another addicted person so that they can both get through the day. And in those cases, I think we have now some wisdom gained over the years to trust some of the public health professionals out there to look at science, to look at the, the, the way that the, the treatment modalities work, and use the criminal justice system to help nudge people in that direction. But we don't come down on them like a hammer now and, and figure that just sending people to prison is going to get us out of this situation. We did that once, and it's always going to be known as the war on drugs, and it's always going to be known as a spectacular failure. Uh, I'm determined that, that we don't repeat history in this case. But you had to work hard to kind of reach this point, because before you got to this point with the LEAD program, there was a lot of uh, knocking heads between uh, you and people in the Public Defender Association and others that are working in this area, probably even with the treatment folks, about how you're handling it. Well, but, but old prosecutors can learn new tricks and we can find <laughs> new partners and, and just really, I think, knowing that we have the ability to change lives uh, you know, in the system, we have the drug court, we've used that for 20 years, and that, that's an abstinence-based 12-step program, and, and, it, and it's worked for lots of people for lots of, lots of years, but we also have some new approaches, too, that don't even require us to get people into that courtroom. In fact, we don't have the capacity in our courtrooms to get all the people help who need help. So the question is, how can law enforcement uh, and, and work together in, in uh, partnership with public health experts to really address the medical needs here. 
I want to bring in uh, Chris Naira. Uh, Chris, can you step up here for, with me, please? He's the lead national support director for the uh, Public Defender Association here in Seattle. He's been involved in this type of work for a long time. I take it you and Mr. Satterberg know each other quite well and have, have maybe have had those sessions where you're knocking heads and all that stuff. But, um, you know, one, one thing about the lead effort is that some people are saying it's, it's harm reduction. And there's been concern about, you know, is that really the way to go? Well, yeah, and I think it gets to some of Dan's point that you need a broad spectrum and a continuum of responses to this. And one of the things that we've discovered in the LEAD project is that we're working with a population that is chronically homeless and chronically addicted. This is a population where sanctions often don't work. Some of these individuals have spent lengthy, lengthy times in the Washington State Penitentiary. Some of them have relapsed within 24 hours of being released from prison. And we can't even stop people from using while they're incarcerated. So this is, this is, this is like this need for this reality-based approach where we try a variety of different responses to people who use drugs. And one of the things that we discover in the LEAD program is that it's not flipping a switch. It's working with people intensively over a prolonged period of time until they can get to a point where they're actually capable of making changes. Can this make a difference? Oh, absolutely, and we're seeing it dramatically uh, in just in the LEAD project here in Seattle, and it's now being replicated. It's been replicated in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and in Albany, New York, and there are jurisdictions literally from Maine to California, ranging in size from huge cities like Los Angeles and Chicago to tiny little towns. But do we know if it's actually um, decreasing or putting a dent in the number of people that are using heroin? That we wouldn't know. What we do know is that it's making a difference for the individuals that are interacting with the program. But one of the things that, that we, we know is that, and it gets kind of to a point that I'm really glad that Dan made, referencing the crack epidemic, is that, that we have epidemics of drug use in this country all the time, and they're very cyclic. And so far, nothing that we have done has stopped those epidemics from happening. And we tend to be very, very reactive to things that happen. So we reacted to the crack epidemic. We reacted to the AIDS epidemic. By the time we started doing anything with the AIDS epidemic for drug users, there were communities in the United States where 60 to 70% of the people were already HIV positive. So I'm hoping that the discussion that we're having now and that's taking place in other parts of the country will get us out of a reactive mode and start coming up with some sort of broad public health-based approach to this. Are we getting there? Thank you very much. Are we? Are we reaching this point where we're not being reactive, but we're trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to deal with this to preempt? Um, so I think we want to make sure we really understand, and the, and the general public needs to understand what we're talking about with opiate addiction. So everybody in this room, if they took opiates regularly, would become tolerant to them. A small proportion of them would become addicted. Their use would become out of control. They'd be physically dependent and they'd have preoccupation, they'd be thinking about it all the time, they'd have compulsive use, it would disrupt their ability to show up to work, have good friendships, it would get in the way of those things. That's opiate addiction. That's a medical condition that is driven by bi biologically what's going on in your brain, needing opiate receptors. Untreated opiate addiction is a potentially fatal condition. We have medications that people can take that bind to those opiate receptors and help them feel normal that cuts their chance of dying in half by 50%. That's a fundamental understanding that people need to have is that opiate addiction is not a fault of a person. It is a medical condition and we have medical treatments that can reduce mortality. And that's a basic understanding that everybody in society has, not just so that if I become addicted, I can go talk to my boss and my friends but also the prosecutor who understands when he's interacting with me, we're dealing with fundamentally a medical condition. And that that's, we don't usually use a law enforcement hammer on most medical conditions. We don't use it on uh, people who drink alcohol. That's not what we do. So trying to rethink, rejigger all of that so that we can get acceptance in our society so we don't have stigma making people hide from their families, making families hide from other people. This, this takes social support. It takes everybody really working together to deal with this problem because we have the tools. Just most people don't know about them. I want to bring in uh, Thea Elephant Wells. Can you come up here with me, Thea? Uh, you're a social worker at, uh, with Seattle and King County, but you've been there. You were an addict at one time. It's true. I was addicted to heroin 10 years ago. How, I guess, how did you get there for one thing? Oh, man. Where do I start with that? Um, 
I think um, being young and being traumatized probably was the way in for me. Um, you know, opiates are great painkillers, whether that's emotional pain, psychic pain, physical pain. Um, and I was definitely in some emotional pain as a teen. And I just happened to know someone who was using. And, um, you know, I, I think from the first time that I tried opiates, I found something that made me feel the way that I would always want to feel. And I can remember as a small child going into the refrigerator to get the cough syrup long after my cough had healed. So I think that I was drawn to opiates, you know, way before I became addicted to them. How did you get out of it? Well, that's also a long story. <laughs> um, it, it wasn't any one thing. And long before I stopped using heroin, I had people working in my life to try and help me get there. Um, and I think that that's so important. That harm reduction piece, when you have people that treat you like you matter, that you're worthy, and that you don't have to quit using to matter and to be worthy is amazing. I also had, you know, a social worker at the Needle Exchange. Um, Where who, you work now. Yes, she retired and I'm now in her job, which is a trip. But um, she was one of the only people that talked to me about my goals and dreams. And it's like once you're addicted, nobody talks to you about what you really want for yourself and your life because you don't, it's like, you don't get to have dreams anymore, that you just become that one thing. And having people in my life that believed that I could do better, that held hope for me when I had no hope for myself, really helped me along. And then when I had those moments where I really was reaching out for help, having help available, and the type of help that I wanted, that I believed would work for me, and it wasn't any one thing either. I had mental health, issues that I really needed to address. Um, and so like so many of us who have co-occurring disorders, I really had to do a lot of work. And I had the right situation for doing the work. I had welfare at that time because I was disabled by my mental illness that was enough for me to get a room in an Oxford house. A lot of times nowadays there isn't a safe place where you can start building your life in recovery. Um, then I just had the, the perfect set of circumstances to really rebuild my life. I'm going to ask you uh, what some might feel is an inappropriate question, but how old are you? <laughs> I had to think about it. Um, <laughs> I have that trouble too. I'm 39, um, and I'm certainly not shy about my age because I'm lucky to be alive this long. That's why I asked you, because I've heard you say that that's one thing that you are willing to say, how old you are, because you never thought you'd get there. Yeah, my 30th birthday, I was in recovery, and of course, as women do, I'm worrying about being 30, and somebody said, wow, it's such a trip that you're still alive, and that just sort of <laughs> shifted my perception, because I've buried a lot of friends over the years. Well, I'm glad you're alive. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, give her a round of applause. You know, um, Penny, let me come back to you on this um, stigma stigmatizing in this whole issue. Your daughter talked about some of these issues mm -hmm. and that how, what she, what she wanted people to know mm -hmm. about the trouble she was dealing with and, and her mm -hmm. addiction. Right, Mira for, you know, her I'd say five years of drug use had escalated um, through alcohol and marijuana, through cocaine and then treatment and not against, not, you know, it was totally against her will. And then she came out, and I think she started to accept the fact that she had a problem. And she unfortunately uh, stole some Oxycontin, and, and she and her boyfriend started to use it together, and then she became a full-blown opioid addict. And of course, heroin was cheaper and more available. And um, through that last couple years, she she came to fully own, as she said, I own that I'm an, ad I'm an addict. She would use that word, she said, I'm an addict, I'm a drug addict. And she would talk to other kids at her school and other groups of people and just laid it out there. She wasn't uh, afraid of being judged. She, she knew who she was and she owned it and she worked real hard to get well. 
and she started the AA 12-step program. She got a sponsor. And um, as we'll probably talk further tonight, there's so many, uh, such a complex disease that there's no one avenue to sobriety and recovery. And uh, for people who, who um, try the AA program, some it works, some it doesn't. But we all know this is a disease of relapse. And she worked hard, did the 12 steps, and um, I don't think she had been using for a long time. She was living with me then when she died. So she was trying very hard. Uh, I want to tell folks here that if you have a question or comment that you'd like to make, please step right up here in, in the aisle way, and I'd like you to work you into the conversation. Don't be shy, please. I, I'd like to do that. Um, I, I, want, I want to talk more about treatment and, and the challenges here. Um, we, we seem to be doing a pretty good job of telling you that there is an epidemic and that, you know, we're obviously getting a lot of coverage about this as we're doing tonight. But one of, it seems to me one of the huge challenges is the treatment area and, and getting people into treatment, but, I, but also uh, for communities to accept where people can come to get treatment. Molly Carney, talk about that. There are so many challenges related to the treatment system right now. Um, as has been alluded to earlier, we do need a lot of tools in our toolbox so that people can try the type of treatment that they are inclined to try. They're often uh, more successful if they try a program that is of interest to them rather than only having you know one approach that's possible. So um, having uh, abstinence-based programs, having harm reduction options, and having medication-assisted treatment are all important um, components of a, of a healthy treatment system. It, it is a challenge, though, in that there are, there's much more demand for treatment right now than there are um, spaces available to treat the, the number of people in need. So communities across the region and across the state, and in fact, across the country, are uh, really uh, uh, hamstrung by the fact that there's not enough treatment available. So we do need to expand capacity. There are two different main camps of uh, treatment in the medication-assisted treatment world, and the reason that medication-assisted treatment works is that it helps to stabilize the brain chemistry that's become so disrupted through the use disorder. Um, it is, is the standard of care right now for treatment, so it's important to help the public understand that that's the fact, that that's how the medical community and the scientific community understand medication-assisted treatment right now. But most people, in fact, most probably many people in this room don't know what it is, or they hear the word methadone and they have a negative reaction to it, and that um, is one of the reasons that I try to get out into the public and speak about the realities of medication-assisted treatment as much as possible. There's a lot of stigma around the treatment, just as there is stigma around the disorder that we're trying to treat. So education, education, education is incredibly important right now. As, as the Frontline documentary showed us that in Bremerton, where there was opposition to a methadone program, uh, that they couldn't get established there because people thought it was bringing meth in. So there was an education issue there. Question here. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, actually, um, I, I wanted to make a comment. Um, I have an unusual pers perspective because I'm a doctor, but my son died when he was 24, 10 years ago, because he was an OxyContin addict. And in the year that followed that, I was lucky enough to meet Caleb and do a lot of personal research and to connect with other physicians and try to impress upon the people I work with, physicians nationwide, that we have to be really careful about prescription opiates. There's a problem. Um, as you've heard, 20 years ago, we were told that we weren't treating pain appropriately, and we had to change the way that we did things. But uh, there was only one real option, and that was opioids. Nobody talked about acupuncture, massage, psychotherapy, all the things that may work to help people in pain. Um, I, I could go on for a long time. You don't want to hear everything I have to say, but I do want to say that physicians are in a difficult position. The pain lobbies, the pharma lobbies, uh, have a lot of power at the national level. Um, if you're a physician, you're now uh, being rated on how your patients feel about you, and if you're a patient in pain and you feel that your physician isn't giving you the right amount of pain medicine, 
then you give them a bad rep. Um, it's terrible, I agree with you. People are still prescribing large amounts of opiates for a situation where three to five days worth of opiates and after, after losing your own son in this, how, what have you been trying to do to change what's going on? Um, I've always been frank about Robin's addiction. Um, I've never hidden it. I encourage people to do that. Uh, I educate the people I work with. I've gone to Washington. I've talked to the FDA. Um, I've done a lot of things. I actually made a documentary with KCTS. <laughs> I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's taken 10 years for anything to happen. And one of the things that worries me is that it was the word heroin that caught the public attention. There are billboards in New York City now that say, um, would you let the doctor give your child heroin for a sports injury? Maybe that's what people need to hear. The, the way your brain feels on heroin is approximately the same as any other opioid. Thank you very much for sharing. I appreciate it. Well, Caleb, I, I want you to weigh in. Part to come up with here. Mm -hmm. keep, keep joining. Do you want to respond to that? I mean, she brings up such a tremendous point. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things in there. I, I think it is really important um, for people to realize that the reason we're having these conversations um, we've been researchers together for uh, more than 15 years, and it was very clear what was going on with opiates in the early 2000s. What has taken um, society's interest are high visibility deaths, and in the Seattle area, it's people injecting drugs in public. They've been injecting drugs uh, under the bridge and in their houses for decades. So it's the fact that people are actually using in public. It's this sort of interface of, of homelessness and injection drug use. So opiate addiction isn't new. We've been talking about it for a long time. The difference now is that people don't like it because it's dirty and it's in their city. And so what I hope we can do when we respond to that is to not try to just brush this problem under the rug, literally and figuratively, but to actually treat people well, recognize that opiate addiction um, is a medical condition which we have really good tools to uh, reverse overdose, keep people alive, and keep people alive a long time with drug treatment, but people need to know about that. This whole issue of the war on drugs and, and have, how has that changed now? Well, let me just say that this is, there's nothing easy about this because having an addict in your family tests your patients. They lie, cheat, and steal and break relationships. Having a community full of addicts tests our patients as well. Property crime is directly related to addiction. If a person is addicted and they're living in a tent somewhere in an encampment, they have to go out and commit a crime that day to be able to get enough money to be able to not go through withdrawals. And so you multiply that by thousands of people, uh, and, and it, it, it tests the collective patience of the community. And we have seen it here in the response to, to the homelessness situation and to obvious spikes in property crime. So there's nothing easy about it. It tests our compassion and our humanity to, to be able to see the person who just broke into my car and stole my laptop you know, they're a victim and they have a disease. Well, yeah, but they just broke into my car and stole my laptop. So it's going to take all of us to, to get together and, and figure out, you know, where can we push back on the quality of life that affects all of us. But the truth is, we're paying for drug addiction, whether we lock people up and buy a lawyer for them and get them a jail cell, or whether we get them a case manager, some medication-assisted treatment, and, and begin the long and difficult process of building a human relationship with that person. There's no simple pill that makes you no longer a, an addict. It's really surrounding a person with support. Uh, so as you said earlier, that you can feel worthy, they can feel like you know, they, they deserve to get better. That's long and hard work, and whether we have enough capacity to do that in our community, I don't know. What's your comment? Uh, yeah, I did have a question, but first off, I just wanted to follow up on the statement Mr. Steyerberg made, um, because a lot of the people who are opiate addict, uh, addicted and sleeping in tents are able to feed their addictions through employment. A lot of the homeless or encampments are actually currently employed, so I just, and a lot of the people who are addicted to opiates um, who are housed do commit crimes, so 
I just wanted to throw that out there real quick. But my question was actually, there's been a lot of discussions about um, safe, in, uh, safe consumption sites, safe injection sites, and a lot of different models um, for how that might work, and a lot of momentum to open something like that up in King County. I was wondering um, how many panelists here would support that, as well as uh, maybe by a show of hands, how many uh, audience members would support a safe injection site in Seattle? No, audience, how do you feel about that? We're getting a number of people to raise their hands here. I guess quite a few, yeah. Well, uh, thank you. And actually, this is something that's already happening in, Va in Vancouver. It's been happening there for quite a while. Can you weigh in on that? Patty, Caleb. You've been there. Sure. So, um, so uh, safe consumption facilities are places where um, people can bring their own drugs in and used in a supervised, clean, safe place with uh, medical staff, typically nursing staff, on site. Um, and have clean supplies. And so that hopefully the idea there is that you're preventing the spread of infectious disease and you're preventing fatal overdoses. And there are uh, almost 100 of these around the world. And the outcomes that have been out there are, are generally quite promising, both in terms of um, community uh, discarded syringes in the community, in terms of overdose, and so on. So I think the public health research is pretty clear that there's um, a lot of evidence there that would support those programs. What I think is important for people to also be thinking about is where do those services live and what do they look like? How do we make them part of sort of a comprehensive set of services? So if a person comes in that day and they need and want to use, they can use. If they uh, are developing a relationship with a, a case manager or the nurse over time who keeps mentioning to them, hey, you know, we've got some other stuff. You know, you mentioned you have hep C. We have treatment medications for that. We can get you hooked up with that or we can get you into drug treatment if you're interested in that, or we have housing services. The idea is that it can be the front door, and it's worthwhile just to keep that person coming back and keep them alive. That is a worthwhile endeavor in and of itself to allow a drug user to keep using. That is worthwhile in and of itself. It's also worthwhile to offer them another broad array of services so that they can get as much control over their life as they can. That's how do you see this? I think we do need to recognize, though, here in King County, which is a giant county, that heroin and opiate addiction reaches every corner of it. So let's not kid ourselves at a single area where we, you know, people can come to have a supervised consumption. It's going to serve the needs of the community. If somebody scores some heroin in Auburn, they're not going to jump on a bus and ride for two hours to get to Seattle to use their drugs. They're going to use it where they are. So I think that one of the things that we need to do, and a lot of be a lot of heat and political capital and and screaming about a, a supervised consumption site, it's, it's more important to me for every community in our region to realize they've got heroin right there, and it's not just something that happens in the big city. I'm going to mention two quick things related to that. You know, we, the best way to understand what drug users need is to ask them, so we ask them regularly at Syringe Exchange Survey and other places, and 87% are interested in safe injection facilities, and over two-thirds are interested in getting help to reduce their use. That's something we don't always think about when we think about people who are um, addicted, who are opiate addicted. I think we have this sort of, sort of delusional idea from movies that people are having a great time and getting away with something. And that's not the case. People uh, feel terrible. They physically feel bad. They're constantly in a cycle um, of being high, out of control, and in withdrawal. It does not feel good. People don't want to be using. They want, um, they want help not using. So I just want to put those things together. People want these services. Another issue is that uh, a lot of times for people to get into treatment, it's a, it's a big leap. So offering, understanding that change is along a continuum and that it's not dichotomous. You're not a user or in treatment, but that there's, there's a lot of options in the, in the middle is very important. And harm reduction and a safe in consumption site are two pieces of how to help people move along the continuum until they're actually ready to say, you know what, I really am ready for treatment now. Because again, in our program, people have to come on site and get their medication in front of a registered nurse six days a week. It's incredibly rigorous. So there's a big leap between active use and being ready to engage in a treatment program uh, like an opioid treatment facility. And we're also looking at trying to build a broader continuum of services that are in more places that have varying level of intensity, given that you know, many people are struggling with mental health issues and housing issues and, and a whole host of things. So there are intensive models. We're also looking at uh, creative ways to build uh, some lower threshold models, easier to get in and start. My name is Enrique Gonzalez. I'm also with the Public Defender Association along with Chris, but I'm also a, a, a member of the Board of Trustees here at the museum. So it's an honor to have all of you in, in bringing this topic to light. Um, my question is actually two-part. Um, 
The first is that, you know, it was mentioned that this, this epidemic crosses racial boundaries and that everybody is affected by it. Um, I will say though that in communities of color, uh, the perception at least is that this is a response to a white epidemic and that this is, uh, the, the type of reaction uh, is different now that more of white America is being affected by it. And so uh, communities of color uh, are feeling that there is um, a, 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 di you know, a divide in how people are being treated and how, how things are being reacted to. And so I just wonder how is it that we can bring more communities of color into the picture and feel as if also they're part of this, the solution. And then the other question is um, briefly, is that you know, we're talking here about what's going on locally and we think of, I think a good way to think of the epidemic is how we're at the end of the spigot, we're at the end of the hose, where does it start? And if we look at kind of what's going on globally, what role do we play locally in the, in the global conversation around consumption? Take that first issue. Um, you know, I think in the Frontline documentary, they made very clear that this was aimed uh, as very big in, in the suburbs and among white Americans. Uh, and obviously, it might have came from the opiates. Um, want to com comment on that, please? I've read that 90% of the heroin addicts that became addicted in the last 10 years, 90% are white, 80% started on prescription opiates. So yes, the demographics have changed, uh, and so has our approach, and I think you have to acknowledge, I'm willing to acknowledge that that there are, that is a, a different approach than we took when it was just cocaine in the urban city. And during that time, across the country, 60% of people prosecuted in cities for cocaine, uh, crack cocaine sales were African American, 60%. So yes, it was, a, it was a racist approach. Yes, we can learn from that, but I think we have to learn from that. I think we, 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 otherwise we're just gonna repeat what we did. So let's acknowledge the, the mistakes of the past. Let's acknowledge that this is a much more widespread issue uh, right now and that it, it is our opportunity and we still have to break through a lot of denial over people who don't want to know that it's happening in their community, don't want treatment. Well, they, they may not want a treatment center in their community, but they have heroin in their community and they shouldn't want that either. So it's, there's a lot of public education and, and there's a lot of, I think, necessary soul searching about what our approach over the last 30 years, but it doesn't mean we have to repeat it. Uh, the last part of the question that he had there, if you want to touch that. Um, that question was huge. Let me see if I can answer that first one. <laughs> um, I do just want to mention that the, we greatest, might not have time for the, other the one greatest one. racial disproportionality we have in what greatest racial, racial disproportionality, that's a mouthful, that we have in Washington State and in King County for opiate involved deaths is among Native Americans. There's a great racial disproportionality there. And so that's really important that we acknowledge that that community across the state has been hit really hard for a host of reasons. And I will also say, that many tribal communities have done some of the most innovative things in terms of having um, huge, huge number of people on treatment medications, distributing the antidote naloxone out in communities. So these tribal communities are also taking a lot into their own hands, but there is a lot more that needs to get done. We need to make sure we have culturally appropriate treatment services that are actually available and accessible to people. I have a family member who's been uh, addicted to drugs for probably 12 or 13 years and has been in and out of treatment more times than I could possibly remember. And um, every time he comes out, he goes back to using. Um, but one of the things that he stated was the biggest hurdle is that when he got out, the situation was generally the same as when he, um, before he came in. And since the situation hadn't changed, he uh, felt like the only thing that would help was the use of the drugs, which made him I uh, uh, feel like he had a sense of um, normalcy. So I was just wondering if you've considered a longer treatment period. Usually 30 days is the standard for, you know, an in and out. The state will pay for it. And um, I was thinking if there was a longer period of time in which a person would be able to get some wraparound services with um, housing if they're homeless, um, drug treatment. I mean, of course, this is going to be addressed. Um, mental health issues, if um, that's a problem. Um, because if they go back out and the situation is the same, then they're back out in uh, the world, they're back out into uh, doing what they were doing before. It's costing us plenty of money because they're back in um, 
they're using, they're using drugs, they're stealing to get drugs, they're in jail, they are using emergency services, um, they're in, uh, in and out of, uh, it's just a revolving door. So I'm thinking yeah. if there was a... Yeah. Thank you for asking right. that question. It's a great hands. question. Um, and, it, and it speaks to my point earlier about um, there are a variety of treatment options out there. Uh, most families don't really know what medication-assisted treatment is. So the, the standard that m most of the public has is 30-day abstinence-based residential treatment. That's kind of the, that's the, that's the cognition that we all have. Medication-assisted treatment actually operates completely differently. It, it is an outpatient program. And um, it involves medication to stabilize the brain, so it takes you out of this cycle of highs and lows, and it, it literally levels the brain chemistry. But it also includes the assisted part, which is counseling and case management services. It is uh, matching patients up with a medical provider. Um, the counseling is really designed to help them look at the broad array of places in their life that have typically end up pretty destroyed by the time they walk through our admission door. So it really uh, does require people to be on the medication, think chronic relapsing medical condition like hypertension or diabetes is, is a good metaphor. Some people with hypertension or diabetes may need a course of medication for a short period of time. They're able to taper off because they've made a bunch of behavioral changes and they, they are quite successful not being on that medication. Others, however, have a genetic predisposition or they live in an environment or there are a variety of things that coalesce together and, and make them more likely to not be able to get those conditions under control. Opioid use disorders are exactly the same way. So medication-assisted treatment operates with uh, stabilizing people on medication for we don't know how long. We are only, uh, we have to use trial and error in order to find out whether or not a patient is one who can have a relatively short period of treatment, usually a couple of years, um, and then taper off their medication and do well. Or we have some patients who have been with us for decades, and they take their medication just like someone might take their hypertension medication, and you wouldn't know them any differently. They don't have any side effects of the medication uh, to speak of at all. They're able to re-engage with their family again. They're able to go back to work. They've been successful parents and grandparents and neighbors and community members. So that's a very different model, and, it, and it's very important that the public begin inquiring around this model. Again, there's a lot of stigma around it, and it's, it's, um, it, it, the facts around it is, again, it's, it is the standard of care for the treatment of opioid use disorders at, at this point in time. And I think it's really important to describe what that stigma is about, and it's basically framed as you're just swapping one addiction for another, and it's not. You're taking a person who is addicted, who is also opiate dependent, and you're dealing with the opiate dependence with medications, and the addictive behaviors go away. And so it actually ends up being recovery support medications. And that's a profoundly different way to view those medications. And so the basic bottom line that I say is as long as the person is doing well, they should stay on those medications. We don't say, wow, my depression really got stabilized on Zoloft. Let's get them off of that Zoloft. Right. That's not what we say. Right. So why do we have another standard for people with addiction? There also are many people who um, have to go through a number of cycles of treatment before they're able to say, I, have, I need some help in order to do this. I need to do it in a way that's different than what I've done before. So we have a lot of people who cycle in and out of treatment just not wanting to um, accept the fact that they've got a chronic relapsing medical condition that they're unable to treat successfully with um, an abstinence-based approach in our, in our case. So, and again, those folks who do make that transition and for whom the medication is successful, we're, we, see, we see lives turn around. It's transformative. So, Penny, I, when you found out your daughter was using heroin, did you know what to do? Did I what? Was that a Did you know what to do? Did you? No. No. This is all new to me. And, and uh, what I learned is even though I, I'm a, a journalist, so I can research and dig into stuff and have lots of contacts in this city, it was a quagmire of where to go and how to treat her. And, and um, just there's no one central clearinghouse for parents to go to and say, this is my issue, this is how much money I have, what are the standards of treatment. Um, I wish I had known more about medication-assisted treatment when Mara um, relapsed the second time, so she was in treatment twice. <clears throat> and I wish, and remember she talked a little bit about Suboxone, which is one of the drugs yeah, they use, methadone, that. Suboxone, buprenorphine. And she goes, I think that's just swapping one drug for another. 
And I didn't know enough about it to say, hey, let's give it a try and see if we can get you stabilized. And um, that's like you were saying, that's the stigma about medication-assisted treatment. I'm not well, I'm going to keep using opioids and I'm going to stay ill. So that was her opinion of it as well. So I wish I had insisted on her trying that back then. But yeah, no, I didn't know what to do. I had no idea where to go. And people still don't know. I get calls and letters and emails from people. It's like, I don't know what to do. My child's using heroin. They're on the streets or they're 15 or they're 25 and working. They just throw up their hands. No one really knows where to start. Good job. Penny, I know that one of the things that, that you have been doing as well um, is obviously talking about what happened, um, but also working uh, to try to help law enforcement with the Narcan or Naloxone, which you have some with you right now, right? Can you show us this? Sure. This, this, tell us more about this also. Sure. Yeah. sure. So the idea is, is that... Um, if a person is having an opiate overdose, an opiate overdose is a person having more opiates than their body can handle, and their breathing slows down, and it usually takes a few hours before the person dies, and that represents a window of opportunity. And so these, these are two intranasal kits for a medication called naloxone or Narcan, and this can, they literally get squirted up a person's nose, and in two to three minutes, that person can be breathing and alert again. And so there's a lot of different ways to get these medications out. We're actually just about to come up on the six-year anniversary for Washington State's law, the second in the country, that allowed naloxone to get prescribed to anybody at risk for having or witnessing an overdose. I actually got this kit four years ago at a pharmacy prescribed to me by a pharmacist. I didn't have to go to a doctor. And so people can find out where to get these medications at stopoverdose.org um, and find out how they can get these medications and how to recognize an overdose and prevent an overdose. So this is really important for anybody who uses opiates or lives with somebody who's an opiate user or is in that social circle, for them to have those medications. They're most likely to see an overdose. But there are other ways also to get naloxone out in the community and reverse overdoses. Paramedics has carried it for decades. It's in emergency rooms and operating rooms. And then more recently, the Lummi Tribal Police were actually the first police department in the state to carry naloxone. And uh, more recently, uh, the Merit Project, through uh, Pena the Gates' work, uh, the Seattle Police Department, the bicycle officers are carrying naloxone and have had several, several overdose reversals just in the past month. Is this going to be important for... Yeah. Uh, and thank you, Penny, for the project, for making this effort to make sure that law enforcement it's locally... It's a tiny piece of a very complex puzzle, but it allows that person who is in an overdose state to live to see another day. And, Mary used to say, we're not throwaway people, Mom. And so <clears throat> I think of the people that the bike officers find on the streets or in a, alone in a uh, bathroom downtown in a public place. And, and you know, it's, it's so incredibly heartwarming to, to know that the bicycle cops are carrying it and that they want to carry it. And each time they've reversed, there's been six or seven of them now, each time they've done it, um, I hear from the police department and, you know, there's commendations to the officers who are out there really wanting to save lives. I know there's a lot of conversation about, you know, helping once you're already addicted, but what about the conversation about how to um, prevent things like this, um, especially from an early childhood focus? Like, uh, both of my parents... Um, heroin addicts. Um, my dad was pushed into school a year too early, so he was constantly behind. He grew up with really low self-esteem, didn't feel good about himself, and then, you know, went into heroin. My mom was, um, like, molested and abused, went into heroin. Um, and then, you know, me and my brothers were clearly neglected because we had heroin parents, and my dad was just never around. So, also, my brother, since he grew up like that, we have you know different personality types. Um, he's really sensitive. Now he's on heroin on the streets somewhere, and it's I, a cycle. It's a cycle, but also I know from firsthand experience, I would go to school in you know dirty clothes and no food, and nobody cared, and nobody cared about my brother either. It, I, I actually, you know, and then I have a son who has, like, mental health issues, and I, I actually care, and I'm an advocate, and I've gone to 
and there's so few resources for, you know, um, mm -hmm. mental health for children. They, I've been told, get on a waiting list for six months. I've gone to, you know, um, psychologists and psychiatrists, and if they can't just diagnose and write a prescription, they're like, we don't know what to do. Um, the school district is terrible. They will only provide resources for children who are academically blind and... Let, let me ask them a question here, to, not to interrupt, I'm sorry, but, but where do you turn? I mean, she brings up a good point about, at, you know, how do we educate uh, and how do we, it's a prevention thing. I mean, I first want to acknowledge her, her bravery um, for talking about these issues because they are real issues and they impact so many of our lives. So thank you. <laughs> and, and she brings up a really important point. I mentioned sort of genetic predisposition for addiction, but another huge component is a, a history of trauma. As, as Thea talked about as well, a history of trauma dramatically increases a, a child's um, chances um, of becoming addicted in the future. So we have sort of a general risk in society, and then we really need to also be looking out for kids who have a history of trauma and know that they are primed uh, much more so to end up uh, having to deal with addiction issues as well. And I think Penny talks really well about the fact that Mara didn't just struggle with addiction, she also struggled with mental health issues and with the traditional schooling system. And so, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I think, you know, the need to, you know, harm reduction, we think about it in drugs, there might be harm reduction in schools as well in terms of how do we teach. Sometimes the way we teach induces harm instead of reduces harm, so how do we think about those issues as well? Well, I think we have a whole mental health crisis also in our country, and um, we know that a lot of mental illness is related to drug use. Certainly in my daughter's case, she had code disorders, she had anorexia, she was depressed, she had severe depression, anxiety, ADHD, all these things complicated her life and made her more prone to self-medicate to feel normal. As you were talking about Thea, she felt, she felt normal when she was on opioids. And so one of the things that we're looking at on the King County Task Force and also the Mara Project is a type of module that we can put into schools that would enable teachers to have conversations with kids at a young age and, and better mental health screening. You know, how many of us got like the eye screening, right, and the, hears, the, ear, you know, the hearing screening in schools? But there's like very simple kinds of questionnaires that you can do that DSHS uses that could help screen kids at an early age for trauma and then therefore start funneling them into a support system through school. And there's an organization called Not One More, which I'm a member of, and, and other groups that are speaking in schools now in, in big assemblies about heroin addiction, and they've been pretty effective. We've actually had kids come forward after these, these talks we've given and say, I know somebody who's got a problem, when it, it's usually them. So people are coming forward for help, and it's, it's a big problem. Yes, prevention is huge. Yeah, it just seems like even the littlest of kids who have problems they don't have anywhere to turn. There's not really, um, like I said, I've spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resources, and there's just really no help. And it's really sad because I can literally see firsthand kids like slipping through the cracks and you're looking for help and you're looking everywhere and there's still nothing. Thank you for sharing, I appreciate it very much. It's very. Okay, I think we have time for to say hello there. Hello. Yes, harm reduction is very important. It goes far beyond the addict. I'm clean and sober. I have hepatitis B as a result of a needle stick. I was on janitorial staff of the lodge, which I was a member of. So harm reduction goes beyond. I got hepatitis B from a needle stick when I was doing uh, trash removal at, as janitorial. It goes, I see needles in playgrounds and whatnot. So every needle that goes into needle exchange or safe in, injection is uh, one fewer needles in the environment. So it's not only for the person who is actively addicted. It can that jeopardize anybody of the needles that are floating around in the environment. Thank you. Hi, um, I have a 22-year-old son who's 
suffered from drug addiction for probably the last six to seven years. Um, you know, uh, your average great kid growing up, you know, we never saw this coming at all, but um, it's, it's been six years of pure hell for a, an entire family and, and friends and, and everyone who just loved this kid to death. But I'm happy to say he's four months sober today. Um, but I have kind of a two-part question because well, first, let's give him a round of applause for okay. that. Okay, yeah. That's good. He's in a treatment facility down in Arizona. And, um, but the challenge to get him in to a place was the hardest thing ever because insurance-wise, he doesn't have insurance. He has state insurance. And this has been so awful. He was on the phone with treatment centers begging to come in, begging, and every day, call back again tomorrow at 8, call back at 10, every day, sorry, there's not a bed, there's no bed. I mean, uh, uh, someone coming off of heroin, detoxing, they can't wait. They, they got to go, or they're getting sicker and sicker. Um, so the other, so that's, that's the hard part. Um, I'm, my worry is if, you know, he relapses again, or, you know, if, if, if there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, Everyone says there's so many resources out there, but if you don't have $20,000 a month to keep these people going, it's almost impossible. Um, the other part of our issue is while doing, you know, being on heroin and that, and the, the tendency of, um, you know, he stole from a store. So then he's got um, law, dealing with the law. So now we've got a kid in a great treatment facility, he's got a job, but now he's got to come back here to go to court and deal with that. And it's this cycle of, I'm so worried, what's going to happen? Can't there be like a program to kind of help if they break the law with some kind of a drug issue and, and they see that they're, they're working on it so hard, kind of um, instead of like throwing them in jail, a different type of, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, there could be a program, and there is a program here in Seattle. That's the LEAD program that you have just explained for us, because one of the elements of this the LEAD program is if an officer arrests somebody, decides that they deserve this break, we get this team of case manager and, and wraparound services for these people. But one of the wraparound services that we didn't really appreciate that we needed when we started the LEAD program was there needed to be a prosecutor who could make sure that we're not adding to the harm. Harm reduction means a person does less harm to themselves, less harm to the community, but it also means the system can't do harm to their progress. So I have a prosecutor who looks at the 350 cases in our LEAD program to make sure that if there's a new case that comes up, that we hold back. If it's going to interfere with their treatment bed date, we're not going to file a case of a minor property crime that will disrupt all that and put them back in a waiting list again. So it is part of, a, of an overall system. It's got the, the prosecutor, the police, treatment professionals, all working to really in the best interest of that individual. And so it's not everywhere. Seattle is the first. We're a national model still. But it, it has to be part of that whole wraparound, has to be part of your legal health as well. My neighborhood, um, let's see, Myers Way, Top Hat area is really being overrun by all kinds of things, homeless encampments in the woods and RVs. We had an OD on Saturday night, and a girl died, and don't know if it was the new drugs that are on the street, which is the, uh, hair, uh, the cocaine that's laced with uh, acetyl fentanyl. I'm hearing, anyway, that you're hearing about that today. Uh, so that's brought it to a new level, and tomorrow we're all going into the woods, and we're going to film it, and we've got, you know, police and Cairo and, you know, things like that. And it's, we, you know, we want to take our neighborhood back, but we also have compassion and we, we want to see real, real things happening. Um, and I work in the functional medicine world and there is a test that I'm aware of that's called GenoMind and there are definitely, it's a, a cheek swab, you know, a genetic, um, sort of a screening for mental health, but I noticed there was something about opioids on there. And I thought that might be a, a way for doctors that prescribe to possibly screen very easily. A 30-second test takes two days to get the results. Obviously, when you're in an emergency room, that's not going to work, but that's just one idea. And also the Vancouver uh, thing, I, I was interested in that, uh, what they're doing. And San Francisco at the um, 
The 24-hour shelters like navigation seem to be a good idea. There, you can bring your dog and you can bring, you know, your people from the jungle would probably agree if they had that situation. Also, I'm noticing that there's people coming out of um, re, uh, rehab and there's things called three-quarter houses and they're almost getting put back in the system because there's money to be made there. It's a profit. So that's not good. Um, I, I don't really have questions except for one more thing, the prevention uh, with sugar and children and the wiring the brain for cocaine and things like that. So it's, it's, these are all the things I'm working on, but I think you know, maybe they can speak to some of this, but these are just what I've come up with. Thank you. And thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Actually, I want to move to a couple of my questions here so we can kind of get things wrapped up. Hi, Go Penny. Ahead. Hi, Tim. Uh, I knew Penny's daughter well. Um, first and foremost, I'm, I'm, I'm the face of addiction. I'm a drug addict and alcoholic. I've been in recovery for a while. Um, I think my comment is for all the people that didn't raise their hand for those safe injection sites, get some more education. I don't want your sympathy. I want your education. Um, my question um, is to everyone involved, I, I appreciate you all being here, very much so. Um, a, I want to um, ask, I've heard a lot of we wish, we're going to. I, I want straight ahead fact of this is the money that's going to this, this is the money that's going to that. I can talk about those things all day. I can say, oh, I wish that I had this, or I, I'm gonna get to that. Um, also, I would like to know what other than, I mean, this is a wonderful place, and I'm really lucky to be here, and we all are. I wanna know, how are you reaching out in this capacity to the lower trodden community, the community that I consider myself still a part of, even though my life has changed dramatically over the last few years. So um, those are my comments, those are my questions. Thanks. Anybody want to take that on? <laughs> Actually, let me turn to the air. Well, you know, I work at the needle exchange, the public health needle exchange, um, and we have a lot of customers that are coming in to do syringe exchange. People talk about not doing so well, not really um, knowing what to do next. Uh, they can talk to a social worker and we talk about treatment options and other resources that make, make life a little, um, a little better if, if there's something available. And, um, you know, there's a lot going on with the task force. I think that um, it's amazing the amount of work that has happened in such a short amount of time. We're getting very near um, to talking about what our recommendations are. There is a really talented group of people who are really passionate about doing something different. Um, and I also think right now is a great time. There's a lot of political will. There's a lot of people with power and money um, who are really looking at this situation uh, through a different lens. So I think that there will be some action soon. Um, it's certainly, we've got a lot of momentum. But in the meantime, you know, like Penny was saying, you don't know where to go. I have so many times I pick up the social work line at the Robert Clewis Center and it's a family member or it's a person saying, I don't even know what to do. I don't know what's next. And um, we have a lot of different people in the community that can help talk about treatment options and what might be good and, and to talk about some of the stigma around types of treatment. Nobody wants to be in that methadone line every day. And there's that sense that well, if you're doing this, then you're not really clean, then you're not really in recovery. And we need to change the way that we look at opiate addiction and treatment if we're going to change the way that things are. Um, I know that when I got into recovery, there was a lot of that stigma around um, the recovery community that I was a part of. And thankfully, I had really loving, supportive people that just said, you're here right now, let's work on what you're ready to work on. Um, and I think that we need to allow people to have their own story. Oxycontin is a great gateway drug to heroin. Mm -hmm. Well, methadone is a great gateway drug to recovery. Let's uh, use the tools that we have and s 
Stop shaming people. I mean, the big driver of addiction is shame. And so the treatment shouldn't involve shame as well, or we're not helping people to get better. And um, if anyone wants my card, I'll <laughs> pass them around. If you want to talk about treatment options, if you, don't, if you have somebody who needs help and you want to you know, have some ideas on how to help them, that's what we're there for. And I think there are places in the community, the recovery helpline, um, that's what they're there for, to talk about where to go next if you're looking for help. So. Can I take, a, can right I take an answer hand. to this? Yes. Um, there actually are a number of things that have already been done and, and are very uh, soon to come out of the pipeline. We do have the Washington State Good Samaritan Law, which was passed six years ago, which protects uh, people from um, legal action if they are with someone who has had an overdose death. That's, a, that's an incredibly significant legal uh, change that happened. King County expanded the number of opioid treatment program treatment slots last year by um, many hundred. Uh, we alone at our airport way facility added 400 treatment slots in order to try to meet the demand out there. There have been funds that have been allocated already at the state level to provide a lot more funds for Suboxone prescribing. There is a pilot program under, that's currently being undertaken by our treatment facility and Harborview Medical Center to try to get more doctors involved in prescribing Suboxone. So there actually are a lot of things that have already happened. And then, as Thea just said, the King County Heroin Task Force will be uh, producing its recommendations in September of this year. There are funds available that uh, we are, have every intention of tapping into with those recommendations, so I, I encourage you to keep your ear uh, in the press with that as well. And I think just to understand that there is tremendous work being done. The reason it may not feel like it is we have more than 10,000 active heroin users in our county. We have 25,000 plus in our state. So that, there's a lot of work that needs to get done to meet that demand and meet that need and to do it in a respectful, evidence-based way. So I'm, I'm a very impatient person. I'm, I'm with you. Uh, we, you know, we're doing a lot, uh, but there is a lot more to do. And the scale of what we need to do is, is truly daunting. If I could just ask, add one more thing to that. And we talk about, you know, we wish. Well, um, I think finally the tide is starting to turn in a big way with what we've seen with the CARA Act in D.C., and the fact that we have a King County Task Force looking at opioid addiction and the fact that people are even here tonight talking about it is huge compared to when Mara died four years ago. Um, so we're making progress. It is too terribly slow and people are still dying. There are moratoriums in cities in King County that don't want uh, uh, medication-assisted treatment. Do you know that? That's going on right now. They've, they've passed moratoriums saying we do not want methadone clinics in our community. This is still going on. So when we talk about what we wish for, I just wish that once and for all, we could understand what it is that we're talking about. We're talking about a public health crisis, a brain disease. And if we we're all sitting up here talking about childhood leukemia being at epidemic levels, there wouldn't be one person out there that wouldn't raise their hand that said we should have a safe uh, site where people could come in and get uh, transfusions or whatever they need for their leukemia. Right? There wouldn't be any stigma. There wouldn't be fear. There wouldn't be all this judgment. So when I have a big wish list, I wish that once and for all, we really know what we're talking about and that we stop judging people, that we stop treating people like Thea, like third-class citizens, and she talks about her recovery group being stigmatized. We've just got to stop. We just have to educate ourselves and know what we're talking about and stop the judgment and open up the doors to communities that need medication-assisted treatment facilities. It's, it's, like, it's like glacially slow to get this point to people. But all you need to do is read and educate yourself and listen to people like these experts, and then there's no way in your heart you can say, these people aren't worth it. They're just, you know, it's all about willpower. They're weak and immoral. So there, I've had my say. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jarrett, and my, I guess my first uh, priority is uh, to follow my wife's wishes. She says, please don't embarrass me. <laughs> so, so I'll see if, if I succeed at that. Okay. Um, Good luck. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I'm a retired clinical psychologist, but I, I didn't do any um, primary work in substance uh, use or abuse uh, treatment. Um, but I did. Uh, do my, my doctoral dissertation research and later uh, clinical work on smoking cessation. 
Um, and uh, my dissertation was in the, the uh, mid-70s, but in the, in the mid-60s, over half the U.S. population smoked. And I'm thinking about this from a sort of social and cultural transition rather than strictly a medical, you know, physical kind of issue. And I don't think anybody then would have, in the, in the field doing research or demographics or whatever, would have guessed that now less than 20% of the U.S. population smoke cigarettes. I think that would have been beyond anybody's future prognostications. And it's not because there are that many people chewing nicorette gum, you know, just, or, or, or have gone through successful treatment. This is mostly changes that were not treatment success associated. So I'm, you know, I'm just wondering if there's any potential parallels in what may be starting to happen, or hopefully what could happen with the uh, opiate use um, problem and, and, and the uh, uh, whatever societal and cultural and other non-medical issues that go along with it. Um, so I'm interested in any comments. The other, the other question I, or thought that I had is that even with this discussion, um, there was still a lot of examples that came up uh, from the curative perspective. Uh, detox, looking for a bed, 30-day program, 12-step. Uh, these are all curative um, pers uh, models and perspectives. And it sounds like some of that is still being offered. Uh, in fact, you gave a reference to, um, uh, was it the drug court associated with and, and 12 step and as, uh, as Dr. Carney said, uh, the standard of care is medication-assisted treatment. And so I guess I have, I have little concern that there's still so much um, acceptance, uh, both from the public at large and even within the professional medical uh, enforcement and law enforcement communities of, of approaches that are really not consistent with evidence-based practice. Uh, Let me yeah, so at your, at your you. questions, Jarrett, um, first of all, one of the things that really helped with the amount of tobacco use in this country was a, a very uh, focused public health campaign, and that's really what we're in the midst of right now. So I'm optimistic that that alone will have some impact on the number of people who end up getting into uh, troubles with opioids. Um, the second thing, and I just totally forgot what your second <laughs> thing was. Was that curative versus Oh, the curative, curative yeah. yes. Well, um, so opioid treatment programs have historically been focused in urban areas. So there's a lot of communities, um, particularly in rural areas, where there are no other treatment options. So um, abstinence-based programs are the only option, and they, they can work for some people. Um, again, in the medical community, it, it is seen as the standard of care right now. And, and you heard me just say a, a moment ago that there is a tremendous amount of effort going into trying to get more MDs to prescribe Suboxone in primary care settings. So unlike a specialty clinic like ours, which is federally regulated and offers a, a particular very intensive kind of treatment, there is a second kind of um, treatment that's available through primary care doctors um, using Suboxone. There are not enough doctors who are prescribing Suboxone. There's, uh, there is a lot of stigma about our patients with doctors. So there's education and discussion around that, um, and there, we're really trying to understand why aren't doctors embracing the a very effective form of treatment is, that is available, and are there ways that specialty clinics like ours can provide kind of clinical backup for those uh, primary care docs if they have a patient that really doesn't do well in that primary care setting. Okay. Any final comments that you guys like to make tonight? Dan Satterberg. I just, I'm learning so much from p these kinds of discussions. I'm learning from parents and families who are in distress and want some help. I'm learning from researchers about what works and from clinicians about how to deal with incredibly complicated uh, psychosocial issues of medication. And, and, and I think that's appropriate. I think this time around, maybe law enforcement should step back and, and let the public health experts, let the, the parents and the concerned people of the community define the issue and then we should step forward and say, how can we help? I am just, I am so heartened by the amount of curiosity and openness that I am uh, hearing amongst public discussions like this now. People want to know, and it's through that openness that we can really help educate people, and that's how change will occur. And then, you know, I think places to get information, you know, you, again, you, you cannot recover if you're dead. So keeping people alive is 
critical. So stopoverdose.org is a great place to get information about how to prevent, recognize, and intervene in an overdose. Um, we also, uh, for folks who want to know more about what are opiates, what is addiction, what is the role of treatment medications and psychosocial supports, um, there's a website, drugabuse.gov, from the National Institute on Drug Abuse that has really good information. And then in Washington State, people can just Google uh, the Washington Recovery Helpline and also talk with folks there about the range of treatment options that are out there. Penny, you want to wrap it up? My fear a bit here tonight, or whoever may watch, might be we're preaching to the choir and that people who are here have had experience with a loved one with an issue or, or someone themselves. So I hope if there's some person who's, who's here tonight that uh, your heart has opened and you came here to like learn about the challenges of someone who's dealing with an opioid addiction. Um, there's nothing worse in your life than losing a child and trying everything you can to keep them alive. So my, I guess my last closing statement would be stop judging, stop the fear, and remember that people who are, uh, substance, have a substance abuse disorder are not throwaway people. Round of applause for our panel tonight. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you all that showed up here tonight to ask questions, to also participate. Um, Thank you for being here. On a, it is a pretty hot evening in Seattle, but you uh, obviously this is an important issue, an important issue for our community. So thank you for, for all of that. We appreciate it very much. So on behalf of uh, Key County TV, also MOHAI, the Museum of History and Industry, I'm Enrique Cerna of KCTS 9. Thank you for joining us. Good night. <laughs>